Jessica Mason, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, you served in the U.S. Navy, and now you want to run for Congress. You are running for Congress. Why is that, and what are your priorities? Um, well, I'm from t uh, Dallas, Texas. Specifically, I'm from South Dallas. And in my community, we have a lot of unmet needs. Um, I grew up in that in this district. I grew up there, and things were hard for me and my mom growing up. And then when I returned from the Navy back home, I began working in these same communities as an affordable housing organizer, and I see that these problems are still there, and, and if not, they're, they're worse. So I, I ran for Congress because I want to change things. I want to bring socioeconomic justice to the people in my community. Um, my main uh, priorities are giving you know, better access to health care, bringing more economic opportunities to our community, and then also you know, bringing a new Green Deal to the community to rid us of you know, the pollution that's making so many of us sick. So this is a very crowded Democratic primary, as you know. You're one of nine candidates. So what separates you and why do you think the voters should select you over the others to represent them in Washington? Well, I was the first person to announce my candidacy. I announced in January 2021, I was prepared to challenge the now incumbent because again, I wanted to see a change in my community and I felt like that change could not wait. As far as differences go, I am one of the only candidates that's actually from this district. I am the only candidate that works with the people in this community day day in and day out, knocking on people's doors, asking them what their needs are, and delivering whatever they need to make sure that they can keep you know, a roof over their head and survive. I would say that I'm the only candidate that is truly rooted in this community. And the congresswoman who's retiring, Eddie Bernice Johnson, uh, selected another candidate that she endorsed. Uh, does that make your job any more difficult when it comes to convincing voters that you're the right person? No, and that's because voters, our voters are very smart, they're opinionated, and they'll make their own choices when it comes to who they think will best represent this seat. Um, and again, you know, I was willing to take on a long-term, very powerful incumbent. So if anything, to me, this makes things a lot easier now that she's decided to retire, no matter who um, she endorsed. Uh, you said that there were a lot of unmet needs, and I'm wondering, you mentioned socioeconomic justice. What does that look like for the voter in real terms? In real terms, it means better job opportunities. In South Dallas, we have one of the highest poverty rates in the nation, and that's because we just don't have good paying jobs there. You know, you have a church's chicken on the corner, you have Amazon, they're paying $15 an hour. There aren't any good paying union jobs in the district. And unfortunately, those that were there before the 1990s were removed due to NAFTA. It, it moved a lot of industrial jobs from the community and that took a lot of the money from the community also. So it, it really looks like, you know, just bringing in better jobs and, and that can be done when we start, you know, talking about, you know, pursuing a new green deal, bringing, um, building new green infrastructure and training people in our communities to, to be prepared for the jobs of the future. So let me ask you, because, you know, unfortunately, poverty is not a new issue in South Dallas. So what are you going to bring that's new to the table and that's more than just talk, but action? Well, number one, I, I come to the table with lived experiences. And I would argue that a person who has grown up and experienced poverty is a person who's gonna fight like heck to make sure no one else has to go through it. It's a very damaging and traumatic experience. Um, I think that anyone who goes into this needs to have that understanding of what it's like to go without. And it makes you fight even the harder, you know, even the even harder for those people in the community because I don't want to see another little girl grow up in a situation that I grew up in. I don't want to see another person have to, you know, join the military just to have access to health care or to have access to ed an education. These are things that can be promised and guaranteed by our government. Uh, let me ask you about Build Back Better. Um, as you know, it didn't across the finish line in the Senate. And President Biden said earlier this week that if necessary, he'd like to see it pass in parts if it can't pass overall. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, are there any, is there a top one or two provisions in that bill that if they had to go first and pass first that you would like to see uh, passed? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question and there's just so many good things in that bill. It's hard for me to even want to, you know, break it down into, you know, itty bitty pieces. 
But top of mind right now would most likely be passing the PRO Act, which is the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, which would allow allow people to allow us to have stronger union representation in states like Texas that have, you know, right to work laws. I think right now we need to focus on improving our economy and in order to do that we need again better jobs and, and we need to have give people the ability to strike, you know, against their employer if they're not getting the correct benefits or a $15 minimum wage, especially since it seems like our, our Congress is not able to pass this. We need to allow people to be able to fight on their own behalf by strengthening our unions. I wanted to ask you about inflation because you know everybody's complained about rising prices. Absolutely. Um, have you thought about that much as far as what a solution to that would be? Um, well, when we think about inflation, we have to kind of understand why why that's happening. You know, some people will say, "Oh, it's because people you know got so much help from the government," and then you know others will say that it's because you know some corporations are jacking up prices just because they can. So, what, whatever your your belief is, my belief is, you know, there are corporations that are jacking up prices right now. I think that we need to you know, implement some type of bill to make that make sure that that doesn't happen. And then number two, also we need to focus on putting more money in people, people's pockets, especially those on the bottom who are affected um, more harshly by, by inflation. You know, um, having a higher gas bill one month could, could really take away money from someone being able to pay um, their ability to be able to pay their rent or to be able to keep the lights on. So again, when we talk about Build Back Better, there are a lot of provisions in that bill that would put money directly into the hands of the people at the bottom. And that's why I think we need to really focus on getting that bill passed. And are you talking about tax incentives? Are you talking about just cash payments? I mean, what specifically do you have in mind? Well, well child tax credits, I think, was, was probably like the best thing that could have happened to us last year. It cut child poverty in half. I know that it has expired. I think that it should be um, re-implemented. I think that was a really good way to keep cash in people's, people's pockets. I think also um, subsidizing child care, which is in the Build Back Better bill, that will help parents keep more money in their pockets and, and, off, uh, and offset some of the inflationary uh, pressures that we're seeing in the economy right now. COVID-19, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. Uh, the courts have taken it up as far as the vaccine mandates. Mm -hmm. Where are you on that issue? Because the courts have said, at least as it relates to uh, OSHA's authority, mm -hmm. to rule that uh, companies, private firms with 100 or more employees can tell them can require either a, a weekly test or the vaccine. Um, and the court said, Supreme Court said, no, you don't have that authority. So. Uh, what do you make of that and what's the answer in your mind? Well, what I make of that is is Biden and the administration's ability to help bring the economy, you know, back to a healthy state through instituting mask mandates, testing mandates, and vaccine ma mandates is pretty much, it's, it's done. Right now it is up to corporations and state governments to do the right thing and implement, implement these mandates. Um, I think it's really out of the federal government's control at this point, unfortunately. So do you think that Congress could pass a law or do you think that's pretty much done then? I think that Congress could pass that law, but, but um, I feel like we would end up in the same situation where the Supreme Court would knock it down and, and call it unconstitutional. So we would be pretty much in the same situation as, as, as OSHA is in right now. And so you're saying just leave it up to private companies? I don't want it to be that way, but given everything that I, I really feel like Biden has tried his best to, to, to get these mandates implemented and the Supreme Court has the final say. So unfortunately, it is up to the corporations and it is up to state governments to do the right thing. And you mentioned before uh, that uh, the Green New Deal, um, that took a lot of heat uh, last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so when you mention that, you know, some people might say, you know, they don't like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what specifically, what, what are you talking about? Well, we're, we're talking about moving our country away from fossil fuels and, and moving our energy resources towards renewables. That, that's pretty much all that means. And then creating good union jobs and training for people 
to do this. I know that a lot of people are concerned, you know, workers that are in the fossil fuel industry, well, what's going to happen to my job if we do pass something like the Green New Deal? And I think that it's important for us to communicate to people that, yes, this is going to cost jobs. However, we are going to have a place for you to go. We're going to make sure that you just don't lose out. We're going to, you know, give, you know, grants for those for those in the meantime where they transition into a new a new um, industry or sector in texas that's it's a big industry oh, absolutely. it's the number one energy producing state it is. and so how do you look somebody in the eye and tell them that and especially when you know the u.s energy has has done very well for the country mm -hmm. well i would say that we are already moving towards it i, I want to say at least 25 percent of our energy comes from renewables here in Texas right now. And what we're seeing in a lot of um, you know, local governments, a lot of people are you know, using solar now for their homes. So it's happening. And I think that we need to, to let people know that, yes, this transition is gonna happen whether, we're, whether we want it to or not. So it's either you, know, you, you know, use this chance and this opportunity to, to learn about it and move with it or eventually get left behind. And as far as the energy is concerned, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, if you're going to renewables, it's not the most reliable, especially during the winter. And so um, I'm wondering how do you, what's the solution to that? I would, I would ask, I would have to reject that because I'm not, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, that well, that's what the experts have said. I, right? I, I've seen, you know, some people, you know, say that during the winter storm, it, it wasn't the renewable energy sources that, you know, messed us up. It was just the fact that we didn't have our grid, you know, properly weatherized. So I don't know if, if that's necessarily the case, that renewables are, are, um, are not reliable resources, sources of energy. I wanted to ask you, uh, if you are elected, in the U.S. House, um, at the Democrats, there's a progressive wing. There are also moderate Democrats. Do you see yourself, if elected, aligning yourself with any of them or not? Number one, I align myself with the needs of my district. And when it comes to the needs of my district, there are a lot of social programs that are needed um, to help us eradicate you know, poverty, um, improve healthcare outcomes for the people in my community, and, and provide jobs. Whether that's you know, progressive, moderate, you know, whatever, I don't think really matters. Um, I think that we really need to stop relying on labels so much and focus on policy. So if I do, you know, support like something like a Green New Deal and that's seen as progressive and people want to label me as that, that's, that's totally fine with me. But I'm really just focused on the policies and bringing um, the much needed resources back from Washington to the people in, in Texas 30. And uh, I did want to ask you one other question because this is such a large field. Uh, do you suspect that this is going to go to a runoff? Do I want it to go to a runoff? Absolutely not. Would I want to just take this thing and get more than 50% of the vote? Absolutely. Um, but there is a possibility that it may go to a runoff. And, um, and you see yourself in the runoff? Absolutely. Well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like I had mentioned before, I'm the only person in this race that's, you know, has generations of family in Texas 30. So I feel like the person who takes this seat needs to be someone who represents this community in more, more ways than one. Jessica Mason, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.